Welcome to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser-known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. If I were to ask you which organic compound the chemical formula AS2O3 belonged to, what would you say? I was never the best at science in high school, I got a C. However, I don't think that necessarily matters as this compound was likely not taught to me. The formula AS2O3 represents arsenic trioxide. Although commonly referred to as simply arsenic, arsenic trioxide is actually a different thing altogether. Arsenic is a naturally occurring metal element widely distributed in the Earth's crust and air and water. It's a carcinogen which means that it can cause cancer in humans. Arsenic trioxide, on the other hand, is a chemical compound made by combining arsenic with oxygen. This is the white substance we commonly know as arsenic. It is the substance used by murderous villains in many novels and films. Back in the Victorian era of Great Britain, which is what we call June 20th, 1837 to January 22nd, 1901, after Queen Victoria, arsenic trioxide was readily available. You could visit your local shop to buy some groceries, maybe some alcohol, and if you fancied, some arsenic. The British Industrial Revolution, which lasted from roughly the 18th century to the 19th century, led to an increase in the availability of arsenic. Arsenic was a common element in medicines. When burned, the pure arsenic was exposed to oxygen, which in turn created arsenic trioxide. I do feel like a science teacher at this point, and a rude one at that because I keep saying the word arse, though I'm sure at least some of what I'm saying is probably incorrect. If any scientists are listening, and they would like to correct me, please do. There are many well-known cases of people being poisoned and ultimately killed due to ingesting arsenic trioxide. For the sake of ease, I'll be referring to arsenic trioxide as simply arsenic for the remainder of the story. Adelaide Bartlett, the suspected Pimlico mystery poisoner, is thought to have used arsenic to kill her husband, Thomas Edwin Bartlett, in 1886. Madeleine Smith was accused in 1857 of killing Pierre-Emile Langlier, great accent, using arsenic to keep their affair a secret. Florence Maybrick was convicted of killing her husband, James Maybrick, in 1889. Her weapon of choice was arsenic. And, of course, the Black Widow herself, Mary Ann Cotton. Mary was a female serial killer who is suspected of killing up to 21 people using arsenic. She was hanged on March 24th, 1873. Today's story follows a similar pattern to the above cases, though it takes place even earlier in the 19th century. You also may or may not have heard of the subject of this story, Sarah Dasley. Now I'm not sure whether it's pronounced as Dasley or Daisley but based on the spelling, I'll stick with Dazley. For reference, it's spelled D-A-Z-L-E-Y. You be the judge. This is one Victorian-era poisoner who seems to have been somewhat forgotten. I searched high and low on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox and YouTube, and aside from one short video on YouTube which I haven't watched, not one podcast has ever covered this case. Until now. Our story is set in the town of Potton, located just short of 50 miles north of London in Bedfordshire, a county in the east of England. According to the Domesday Book, the first recorded mention of Potton, the historical name for Potton, is in a land grant to Ramsey Abbey by the Saxon Elfhelm. Probably saying that wrong as well. 
Saxon Ilfhelm was the Elderman or Earl of York. Domesday can be translated from Middle English as, you guessed it, Doomsday, meaning the Domesday Book's modern day name is the Doomsday Book. When I reference the Domesday Book, I'm not talking about scripture, which predicts the end of the world and references the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The book I'm referring to is far, far duller than that. Put together between 1085 and 1086, the Domesday Book is the UK's earliest public record. It is the foundation document of the National Archives and a legal document that is still valid as evidence of land title. Let's return now to the town of Potton. On August 14, 1783, the Great Fire of Potton started when a haystack caught fire and subsequently destroyed more than half of the town within the space of four hours. It's fair to say that I love a good tangent, especially when it comes to history, but let's shift now to this story's main timeline. If we jump forward 36 years from the Great Fire of Potton, it takes us to 1819, the year this episode's subject, Sarah Dasley, was born. Sarah's father, Philip Reynolds, was the village's barber. I guess you only needed one barber per village in those days. Philip actually ended up dying when Sarah was only seven years old. There are many accusations of poisonings in this episode. Still, I'd like to quickly rule out the possibility of Sarah poisoning her father when she was seven. It just doesn't seem plausible. I couldn't find the cause of death for Philip Reynolds in 1826, but I'm confident that Sarah wasn't responsible. Also, just a quick heads up, given the age of this case and the lack of congruence between various newspapers used for my research, many details can't be confirmed. Things such as the dates of marriages and deaths vary from source to source, so take some minor details with a pinch of salt. Following her father's death, Sarah's mother, Anne, became involved with multiple men over the next few years, none of which were what you'd call perfect. Sarah was constantly introduced to new men who her mum had brought home, until, that is, Sarah married her first husband in 1838. Simeon Mead, a Potton resident with a daughter, lived with Sarah in their home village for the first two years of their marriage, before moving five miles east to the neighbouring village of Tadlow. Sarah was described as being very attractive, she had long and flowing auburn hair, she was quite tall which made her stand out, as did her deep brown eyes. It's safe to say that men were rather fond of her. It has been suggested that Sarah and Simeon moved to Tadlow to end several casual relationships that Sarah held alongside her and Simeon's marriage, though that information is unsubstantiated. The pair brought a child into the world in February 1840, although their parenthood experience only lasted seven months. Sadly, Jonah Mead, Simeon and Sarah's only son, passed away in September of that same year. His rather sudden death absolutely destroyed Simeon, as Jonah was his whole world. One month later, in October 1840, it was Simeon's turn to suddenly pass away. Understandably, the local community of Tadlow were raising a few eyebrows at this point. There had been a double death of seemingly healthy father and his son within a month of each other. Sarah didn't help herself as she found a new boyfriend within a few weeks of Simeon's death. William Dasley, a 23-year-old local, made the upgrade from boyfriend to husband soon after meeting Sarah. My research gave me two conflicting dates for when the two tied the knot. A few sources stated that Sarah married William in October 1840, the same month Simeon passed away. Another source has them married in February 1841. Logically, it makes sense that February 1841 is likely the more accurate date of the two. With so many eyes on her already, I wouldn't have thought that Sarah would have met a new man become a couple and got married in the same month that her first husband died. The newly married couple moved to the village of Wrestlingworth soon after their marriage. Located a couple of miles east of Tadlow, Wrestlingworth surprisingly has nothing to do with Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock. 
It's simply one of many small British villages which happens to be located in Bedfordshire. This sleepy rural setting was a stark contrast to Sarah and William's noisy and dark relationship. William liked to have a drink and often found himself in the local pub drinking heavily until the late hours. Despite having many other men in her life, as she had when married to Simeon, Sarah was incredibly frustrated at William's behaviour and apparent lack of interest in her. One evening, when a severely intoxicated William returned home from the pub, Sarah confronted him. A considerable argument took place. The argument became more and more heated until William ended it by hitting Sarah. That one act of violence started a chain of events that, spoiler alert, did not end well for William. Sarah confided in one of her male (coughs) friends, explaining that any man who struck her would not be long for this world. She likely didn't say it as eloquently as that though. Less than a week after William hit Sarah, he started to become overwhelmingly ill. He had no prior ailments, it just happened all of a sudden. Now in the 19th century, it was common for doctors to make house calls. This meant they would visit their patients at their own homes instead of having them come to the doctor's office or hospital. This also happened a lot in most of the 20th century and may even happen today in extreme circumstances. However, I think it's fair to say it can be considered uncommon in this day and age. Dr. Sandal, the local village doctor, visited William at his home and was told that his symptoms were a severe stomachache and violent vomiting. Dr. Sandal prescribed William some medicine which came in the form of a pill. Now this is where it gets rather interesting. Living with Sarah and William was Anne Mead, Simeon's daughter who was a teenager. She was actually looking after William, whereas Sarah was left to make sure he took his meds. William made a slight recovery but struggled with even getting out of bed. The eagle-eyed Anne once caught Sarah tinkering with the pills in the kitchen. It appeared she was making modifications to them, but being too young to understand the significance of this at the time, Anne never mentioned it to anyone, including Sarah and William. You could probably see where this story is going, but I'll fill you in with the details regardless. Sarah would visit Dr. Sandal for a repeat prescription but instead of giving the prescribed pills to William, she would throw them out and give him some of her own. She had made up these alternate pills using what she claimed to be a remedy acquired from the village's folk healer. A folk healer is not a doctor and has no medical qualifications. Instead, they rely on religion, folklore and traditional remedies to attempt to heal people. This was nothing more than a cover story that she told her friend, Mary Carver. She often accompanied Sarah to Dr. Sandal's office. She witnessed Sarah throwing the prescribed pills away to replace them with the ones she had made herself. Mary also recalls Sarah saying she should not give her husband the pills she had gotten from the doctor. Instead, she would give him some others which she had obtained from a lady named Mrs. Gurry, a woman who sold drugs in Potton. Sarah said that Mrs. Gurry knew quite as well as Dr. Sandal what to order for sick folks. William did manage to notice that these new pills were different to the old ones and at first he refused to take them. Anne, however, persuaded William to take them and even offered to take one herself to prove that there was no foul play at hand. That's quite strange considering Anne has seen Sarah tinkering with the pills but bear in mind she was just a teenager at the time. Upon swallowing their respective pills, both William and Anne became ill with the same symptoms that William had had before. Sarah clearly had a way with words as she persuaded William to carry on taking the pills, insisting they were the ones that Dr. Sandal had prescribed. Eventually, William succumbed to the concoction in Sarah's customised pills and died on October 29th or 30th, depending on the source, in 1842. Here's something weird about post-mortems in Victorian-era Britain. Photography as an art form only really took off in the late 1830s and early 1840s. 
Mortality rates were high due to the number of diseases being spread, the lack of hygiene, and poor undeveloped medical practices. If you lived past the age of 40, you'd done pretty well in Victorian Britain. The weird thing is that this newfound thing called photography, which I'm a massive fan of by the way, and the high mortality rate ended up combining. There are many disturbing photographs of deceased men, women and even children from this era that you can readily access online. It was a way of remembering their dead. They would dress up their young kids in their best clothes, pose them on a chair and take a photograph to remember them. Remember the child was dead. That's very hard to comprehend in the 21st century, but it was a vastly different time back then. Bringing the story back to William Dasley, his body never had a post-mortem examination as they weren't common at the time, even for unexpected deaths. Sarah, not one to grieve the loss of a husband for longer than a few weeks, soon began a new relationship with a man named either George or William Waldock. Let's go with William to make this even more confusing. She had already been seeing William Waldock on the side whilst married to William Dasley. Sarah and her latest William announced their engagement in February 1843, 16 months after her first William's death. You may have noticed there's somewhat of a pattern emerging here. February 1840, Sarah births Jonah to Simeon Mead. October 1840, Simeon dies. February 1841, Sarah marries William Dasley. October 1842, William Dasley dies. February 1843, Sarah announces her engagement to William Waldock. Luckily for Waldock, he had some loyal, if not gossipy, friends. They mentioned how Sarah's first two husbands had died unexpectedly. There were even murmurings that she had caused their deaths by poisoning them. Waldock sought counsel from the village clergyman, another word for a priest, and explained the rumours he had heard about his bride-to-be. The wedding was put on hold, and the authorities were made aware of the situation. Before long, the body of William Dasley was exhumed in March 1843 and subjected to a post-mortem examination. When Sarah caught wind of this, she fled to London, where she was captured shortly after by Inspector Blunden of the police. The results of William Dasley's post-mortem revealed that substantial amounts of arsenic were present in his stomach. These findings were confirmed using what is known as the Marsh Test, Developed by James Marsh in 1836, the Marsh test is a scientific method that can detect even the smallest amount of arsenic in the contents of an individual's stomach. The test involves taking a sample from the stomach contents and reacting it with zinc and acid. This produces a mixture of gases that are passed through a heated tube which leaves deposits behind. The deposits are then examined to determine if arsenic is present in the stomach. It can also give an indication as to the concentration of arsenic if present. In 1843, the following month, the bodies of both Simeon and Jonah Mead were exhumed to undergo their own respective post-mortem examinations. A few years had passed since the deaths of both Simeon and Jonah, which meant that any clear evidence of foul play was non-existent. It was determined that Jonah had undoubtedly died due to arsenic poisoning, as had Simeon. However, Simeon's cause of death was merely a logical assumption. That was purely as a result of the level of decay of his body. Sarah was charged in coroner's court with the murder of William Dasley and Jonah Mead. Even so, the grand jury threw out the bill in Jonah's case and Sarah was indicted solely on the charge involved in the death of William Dasley. The charge of murdering Jonah was held in reserve should the charge against murdering William fail. Even though a doctor had confirmed that Jonah died of arsenic poisoning, nothing more than circumstantial evidence could be shown, hence that murder charge was practically thrown out and just kept in reserve. Sarah remained eerily calm throughout the proceedings, which didn't go unnoticed. She pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder concerning William Dasley. Sarah was defended by Mr. O'Malley, 
while the prosecution team was led by Mr Prendergast and Mr Gunning. A key witness in the trial was a shop owner named Mr Burnham. He said he recalled selling Sarah some arsenic from his shop located in Potton. Dr Sandal tied up the loose ends of the story by stating that he never gave Sarah any form of white powder to help treat William Dasley. Here's a summary of the steps Sarah took to kill her second husband. She acquired arsenic from Mr Burnham's shop in Potton and gave it to William. Upon becoming ill, Sarah visited Dr Sandal to acquire some medicine in the form of pills. William took the prescribed pills and started to make a recovery. Sarah then went with Mary Carver to get more pills but revealed that she would be swapping them out for some she had made herself. Sarah makes up some new pills containing arsenic. William continues taking the pills at the insistence of Sarah and pays the ultimate price by losing his life. Many other witnesses gave testimony to Sarah's character. They revealed how she openly stated that she was determined to have seven husbands in ten years. Sarah had also mentioned that though her husband was a good one, she wished him dead and would gladly follow him to the grave. Sarah was noted as saying to the lady appointed to watch over her that she should not be hanged. Her logic was that no one saw her buy the arsenic or give it to her husband. Therefore, she should not be treated as guilty. Essentially, she was admitting her guilt there, but the reason she struck up the conversation was that she wanted to know whether hanging was still common. It took the jury 15 minutes to reach a verdict. They found Sarah guilty of the murder of William Dasley. She was subsequently sentenced to death by hanging, with her body to be buried within the confines of Bedford Prison. Whilst awaiting her execution, Sarah spent the majority of her time reading the Bible. She regularly spoke with the prison chaplain or priest. There is no suggestion that Sarah ever admitted being guilty of murdering anyone. She maintained her innocence. A stark contrast to what she was alleged to have told witnesses as stated in the trial. Time for some more history. Have you ever heard of the Murder Act of 1752? This was introduced to reduce the number of murders taking place, which was astronomical at the time. It stated that all criminals sentenced to death would be refused the right of a regular burial. They would also be executed within two days of being sentenced. Unless the third day was a Sunday, in that situation, the execution would take place on the following Monday. The Murder Act was abolished around seven years before Sarah's conviction, with new legislation stating that executions could not occur in the first 14 days after sentencing. Saturday, August 5th, 1843, was Sarah's execution day. A massive crowd of around 10,000 people gathered at Pedford Prison to watch her make her final walk to the gallows. The executioner was William Calcraft, I'm not making this up by the way, even her executioner was called William. When asked if she had any final words, Sarah simply stated, Lord, have mercy on my soul. The drop was around 18 inches, and after a few seconds of writhing, Sarah was pronounced dead. From what we know about hanging from previous episodes, it doesn't appear that Sarah's neck was broken by the fall. She seems to have died from suffocation due to pressure applied to her carotid artery by the noose. As was customary, Sarah's body was left hanging for an hour before being taken down and transported inside the prison to be buried in an unmarked grave. The execution of Sarah Dasley was the first at Bedford Prison for 10 years and she was the only woman to have been publicly hanged there. That was the story of British murderer Sarah Dasley, better known as the Potten Poisoner. It was also the final episode of the second season of British Murders. There will be a few weeks between seasons as I am preparing to start recording my episodes for YouTube. I've got some great content coming in the meantime though. The first part of the season 2 special will air next week with part 2 airing the week after. I've got a friend telling me the story of a British serial killer. Bobby Holmes, host of Killer Stories, will be back on for Killer British Murder Stories Volume 2. 
And I've also recently had Lorraine on from Once Upon a Nightmare, where we discussed the 2018 film Halloween. So there's plenty there to keep your whistle well and truly wet before Season 3 starts. In the meantime, for more on British murders, please feel free to check me out on social media. The links for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and YouTube are all in the show notes. You can support the show on Patreon, which is where you'll get early access to ad-free episodes, as well as my scripts and a few other perks. I just want to thank out my current Patreon members again, Dale Wilkinson, Jennifer Snap, Stacey Joswiak, hope I'm saying that right, Mary King and Heidi Gray, thank you so much. You can also support the show on a one-off basis by visiting buymeacoffee.com. Thank you to the person who bought me five recently. Your name did come through via email, but seeing as you donated anonymously on the website, I respect your privacy and not reveal your name on the show. The links for both Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee are in the show notes as well. All funds received go towards the show's production and the research. You can email me some case suggestions at britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. You can message me on social media, or if you just want to get in touch, that's how you can reach me. Reviews of the show can be left on iTunes as well as Podchaser. They're greatly appreciated. They massively help increase the show's exposure. But for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio. Cheerio.